Hello, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the What's Next podcast, where I have the wonderful pleasure of welcoming back for the second time, Mr. Tom Peters, one of my favorite humans who's here to talk about excellence. Tom, welcome to the show today. It is a pleasure to be here. And with our live audience, I want them all to themselves to wish my wife a happy birthday because this is her 70th birthday. Woo! So that's my that's my audience requirement. So all thank right. you all because I'm sure you came through for me. Anyway, it's a uh, it's that's cool. It it is really cool. And you know, first let me start by saying Tom that I am so happy to see your face. It, it has been, you know, a long 12 months for all of us, but I just first want to ask how are you? How have you been over the last few months? How are you weathering all this? Uh Given last Wednesday, anyone who gives a positive answer to that question is not my friend. So the answer is relative to what happened last Wednesday, I am not weathering well at all. It really was the worst thing that's happened. Forget the person in charge. It is the worst thing that's happened in 245 years or maybe since the Civil War. This is a BFD, as they say, and I am in a tense mood, foul mood, depressed mood. I love seeing you. There's nothing personal. It's always great to see you, but uh, I'm a long way from have a good day. And that's got to well, be in a, this is This is a big, big, big deal. Well, you know, one of your things is always just sort of, how are you going to be excellent in the next five minutes, right? And so... Yeah. With all this going on, I think, you know, one of the greatest reasons uh, I always enjoy talking to you is because your perspective is one that has seen leaders come and go, both on the political side and you're an ex-military man yourself, right, on the military side, but but more importantly, on the business side. And I, and I feel like this is a time over the last uh, 12 months anyway, where leadership and excellence has really come into focus. And you know, going back to, you know, what I said on how you've been, I know you've been really vocal about what leaders should be doing at this time. Yeah. Maybe you can share some of that. Well, the most important thing I think that I've said, and you should never say that anything you say is important, is if you are a leader of any group, of any size, the way that you have, have, behaved past tense since March of last year and the way that you will behave for, let us say, at least the next six months will define your entire professional career. I don't care whether you go on to do Y or whether you have done Z, which is amazing. The way you behave towards your fellow human beings, particularly those for whom you are responsible that's the definition of your professional life. And, you know, this is a time for thoughtfulness, caring, patience. Uh, I said to somebody, if I was had a group that regularly met, let's say 10 or 12 people who met on Zoom, and we had had five meetings and you were one of the attendees, and you showed up on time or one minute early for the fifth time in a row, I would say, you're in trouble, Tiffany. There's no <laughs> way in hell. I know that you have two young kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way in hell that you can be on time. Forget your productivity. Take care of your family and friends first, and then we'll get all this business stuff down. Done. And, and I, really, I really would take that tone of voice. And, you know, I know we're I'm speaking, being seen by adults, so I will make a remark that I wouldn't make in other settings. I said, you know, I've written an awful lot. I've been on a lot of podcasts on leading in COVID-19 times. And fundamentally, I can state my entire premise in four words. And the four words are, don't be an asshole. <laughs> I, well, it's true. I apologize for using the word, but, you know, that's the point. Um, this is the, and, and of course, the thing relative to what you and I are talking about, and you're a child and I'm an old man, 
uh, if large numbers of leaders are doing the kinds of things that I just talked about, and I think a large number are, I will now put my hands in a prayer mode and hope that some or a lot of this hangs over to the post-COVID days, perhaps a year from now. You know, I've had a million people say it's not an original thought, but you, you really, people like you, people like me have been talking about the people side, talking about the softer stuff side, uh, and the MBA deans still don't get it, if you will, and most bosses still don't get it. But maybe, just maybe, given what we've gone through, that uh, the sorts of things we're talking about will, you know, go, move up higher on the agenda. I really do pray that that's the case. Well, I'm going to share this little ditty here for a second. Uh, this is uh, some new stuff from you, kind of excellence now, the leadership seven. Uh, you know, one of them should be what you shouldn't be. Don't be a <laughs> asshole. Yeah. Right. But be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, be present, and walk in the other person's shoes. Such great advice. I, I mean, we could deconstruct all of this, but I think finding leaders that can embody all of that in a transparent way and sort of show up every day in a virtual setting is difficult. But we see it really happening. Where, where have you seen leaders you know, during this time step up and sort of live these excellent now leadership traits? Uh, I just wanted to pick up on something you said, but I've forgotten what it was. It was so important. Uh, where there's a little company where I get my car fixed. It's part of a bigger chain, and it's called Midas. And of course, we all know Midas Muffler, but this is an auto repair shop. Uh, and I was having some trouble with some car software, and I took my car in. And perchance, the owner was there. And we had a half an hour discussion of what he had had to go through with his personal checkbook, even though he's in a big company, so that he could hold on to every single one of his employees at times at reduced wages and reduced hours during this whole thing. And that's the kind of thing that, A, brings you to tears, makes you, and, and so that's, that's, that's the sort of leaders, I think, those are the people I love. Those are the people I adore, who really say people first. Uh, you know, when I was working or doing, and you and I were part of this, when I was doing podcasts for my last book, and you weren't one person, you weren't the, you weren't the bad person in this, bad is an awful word, if I did 25 podcasts, 20 of them, all done by intelligent, thoughtful people, somewhere in the first five minutes had, Tom, you really talk a lot about this people stuff. What's that all about? And, <laughs> so they clearly know, didn't do any homework on you. Punch in the mouth. It's like, <laughs> what the hell else is there? And, and yet that was that certainly, I mean, you know, I'm one of those people who, would personally, if I could, wipe 99% of MBA programs off the map because they don't, that's not their pitch. That's not their twist. Uh, but it's it's guys like my Midas guy. And, you know, I haven't been doing any original research in the last nine months, but you read the stories in Bloomberg Business Week or sometimes in the New York Times or wherever. There's some people who have really stepped up and really taken care of their people and uh, sacrificed a little short-term profit maximization along the way. They're there. Yeah, I, not, I, not enough of them, but they're there. And one so thing, would, by the way, since I'm staring at you, who are a different gender than moi, is women leaders, particularly we know at the international level, have done a much better job at this than the boys have which is why in all of my new stuff, I'm putting on my top four left list, promote more women into senior management position. I've been saying it for 20 years, but I'm 10 times more focused on that than I have been in the past. I well, mean, there, you know, you, if, if, if you have a big company anywhere in the frigging world, and if less than 45% of your executive team and 50% of your board of directors 
is not women. You are a jerk. You are a shitty business person and you are not maximizing profit or customer satisfaction. You know, don't do it because you have a social conscience. Do it because you'll have higher motivation, more engaged people, and your pockets will be lined with more gold. Well, you know, first of all, there's so much that you said there. If anybody did a podcast with you and didn't know people was your hot button, shame on them. <laughs> first of all. But they Second. wanted but it's not that they probably did, but they wanted me to explain why. I mean, you know, this is what I will not do, certainly in our conversation. But if I was in the bar with somebody, my answer would be, what the F else is there, is there? dude? <laughs> the second thing is you like RBG, right? RBG was like, you know, what's the makeup of the court? She's like, well, 12 women would be good. And you. Yes, I've got right? a T-shirt. I've got a T-shirt with that. And then you and you say the same thing, right? It's like, you know, how. How how will it be that there's, you know, diversity on the board? And, and your joke was sort of, you know, when the women have to add a man. Like, there you yeah. go, right? Exactly. So. Yeah. When there are more Fortune CEOs named Tiffany than there are males who are CEOs. Of, you know, it's that wonderful. I think it was a Melinda Gates quote about, well, no, you know, there are more Fortune CEOs with a first name of James, I think it was than there are women in its entirety. And that's a, that's a powerful line. And it's, it's still awful, true. Awful line. I mean, the one thing, Tiffany, and I, and, I, and I implicitly said this, or maybe sort of said it, but I, I want to emphasize it. I started really working on the women's issue in 1996. And my whole focus was, God bless you if social justice is high on your list. But if it's not, I am telling you to focus on more women for reasons of hard-nosed profitability. And there's a, an incredible amount of evidence that said women are better leaders, but let's forget that. Let's just start with women buy everything. You know, and, and, and what's really kind of cool about that, at least in the USA, is it's been true from the beginning of time that women do 75 or 80 or 85 percent of consumer purchases but now in the united states at least well over 50 percent of purchasing managers sorry purchasing professionals are women so she is just as likely to put out the rfp for a four-year two billion dollar isit contract as she is to pick the location of the family vacation so you know, I don't, I do care. I hope your social, social justice is at the top of your list. But if you just want to get rich, do the same damn thing. <laughs> either way, it's a good idea. Let's just yeah, say either, either way, way, it's a good idea, right? Well, any other thing, I, and for those who, I mean, I have spent a fair amount of time on this research. Uh, women tend to express better human skills but the research says that in leadership, women are also better at the so-called tough stuff, which is delivering on time and all those, you know, little boy things that, that people talk about. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it, it's all psychology for God's sakes. But and one, one other thing I've got to say uh, relative to this whole issue, and sometimes people take me too literally there are a lot of really crappy women leaders and there are a lot of really good male leaders but on average on average the modal leader women beat men in all the leadership scores dramatically but some people say what are you trying to say there's no good man bosses what are you trying to say i had a shitty woman boss one time and i said fine you know, outliers are outliers, but statistically, I am very, very, very correct about this. You, Nick, I, I just want to—I want to take you with yeah. me. I want to take you with me in a little bottle for like a cocktail party and be like, I want to have this conversation and listen to my friend, right? Because it's so many times it's this people take the black and white comment, right? Women are better leaders. Not always. It's not a mean. Like it's not statistically a hundred percent. It's more in the spirit of just being open to going, huh, why is that? On what attributes? 
What is yeah. it I could learn from that versus flat out? It's not because that's right, you're wrong, or because you're wrong, that's right. It's like this middle ground of there are always outliers on both sides. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, when I started this, I was I read, read a lot of uh, genetic research. I don't know what you'd call it. That's not my training. There's a wonderful book by a woman. She's a University of, Southern, University of California, San Francisco neuropsychiatrist. And she wrote a wonderful book called The Female Brain. And it's 400 pages long. And there is one little teeny weeny thing that sticks in my mind on the people skill stuff. By the age of five days after birth, baby girls are making something like four times more eye contact with their fellow human beings. And I mean, I don't know how the jillions of people who are, you know, watching us would react to that, but that was, that to me was just a, a, a one, wonderful telltale. Uh, I mean, actually, it's something else. I think it was in her book. If you have identical, I don't know what, what the term is, identical mixed gender twins, if you and I are those uh, identical mixed gender twins, uh, for the first something like three months in the womb, we are lovey-dovey and hugging each other. And then at the three-month mark, I get my first big shot of testosterone. And the first <laughs> thing I do is start trying to beat the crap out of you. I mean, it's just, it's bizarre stuff like that. And, you know, and we know this stuff now. The neuroscience, is, it's no longer anecdotal. Well, somebody is listening, Sorry, Lauren. Beating you up that fourth month, Tiffany. I, my sincere apologies. I, I think we would get along. I think we'd get along. You, you'd be my wise, <laughs> sage, older you'd brother. Beat the crap out of me. So there. there. <laughs> well, I want to. I want to go back a little bit because I know we we dove right into sort of excellence now and what's happening, but. I want to tell a little story. So it was uh, 1985, I think, or 84. And my stepfather gave me this book, In Search of Excellence. And it was written by this guy, Thomas J. Peters. Now, did I think twice about reading the book and looking who the author was and in my wildest dreams? No, I was like 15 or 16 years old. No, I was not thinking about that. And it was a little complex for me at the moment. But he was like, look, I I feel like you're going to end up in business. And so this is a great book. And then he gave me seven habits of highly effective people right behind this one. Okay. So to time this. So, you know, lo and behold, 35, 40 years later, I have this opportunity to meet this wonderful human by the name of Tom Peters. And I said, like, I'm going to reach out. He's never going to respond. And lo and behold, he, he responded. And so we started this sort of, you know, digital uh, friendship via Twitter and email and phone calls. And I said, hey, listen, I'm writing this book. And he goes, I'd love to read it. And I said, ooh, like that's a lot of pressure. So I sent him the book. He was in New Zealand, I think, at the time uh, you were teaching down there. And uh, he sends me back this email that just blew me away. And he said, I would love to, you know, quote, be a quote on your book. And it was like, it was written smooth as the Mississippi River. And I loved reading it and all of these things. You just sort of go, how interesting in life you go full circle, where the first business book I ever read, 35 or 40 years later, I get the opportunity to meet Mr. Tom Peters. Second time he's, you know, graced me with his presence on my podcast. And we've become, you know, fast friends doing things together, you know, that, that just really inspire me. But I just want you to know, Tom, that you are one of my favorite special people on the Thanks. planet. Uh, and you call no bullshit, which I love. So, you know, since kids are not listening to a live LinkedIn feed, I knew it was safe to say that. Um, but I just, I really, I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. And I just, I wanted to make sure I got that in and told everybody the story of how we sort of connected. One, one, A, first of all, thank you. Those are incredibly kind words. Uh, one amusing thing that it reminds me of is when Bob Waterman and my book came along, uh, Peter Drucker was God at the time, and he didn't think very much of the book. Uh, and I loved it. There was some line somewhere, he made the most insulting comment that he could possibly make in his mind. He said, well, 
fathers are giving now this was you know 30 years ago so there was a little more sexism in it fathers are giving this book to their college sons as if that was the biggest insult that you could ever offer and i pumped my hands in the air and said that is the biggest compliment i have ever gotten and i really do want to say and i know we've got a undoubtedly an ex extraordinary variation of the people who who are watching us and I really mean this. I've got a box somewhere because we all do nostalgic stuff and it's with the best letters that I may have gotten since that first book. And I could give two hoots in hell about getting a letter from a Fortune 500 CEO. The ones that I love are from school principals, fire chiefs. Uh, I got one from the number two guy in the Episcopal diocese in New York. And when you can be helpful, I mean, that that's why I write these books. I don't give a damn about the Fortune 500 CEOs. They don't interest me in the least. And statistically speaking, which a lot of people don't pay enough attention to, uh, only 8% of us work for the 8% of American workers work for the Fortune 500 companies. And so the real numbers are people who are, are doing other such things. But I, I love my box and every now and then I go through it and I'll pull something out from somewhere and it'll, it will be, it'll be a school principal who said, you know, oh, there's, you know, where I live, there's, I'm in New England these days, even though I'm a Annapolis boy and a California boy. And I was talking to a guy who'd been the headmaster at one of those New England prep schools. And uh, he, you know, he told me, he said, I use your book as a way to reform the school or something like that. I love that. You know, that makes it that makes it all worthwhile. One other thing is you read the cover and it said Thomas J. Peters. And there is an author by the name of Ken Oletta and my agent knew his wife, his wife, who is an agent too. And Ken is Kenneth Oletta, but on his book cover, it says Ken Oletta. And that's when I learned I could use Tom Peters. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, it's all, it's all these Tom little Peters. stories. It's all these little stories. Well, we've got some questions coming in. So I want to make sure if you've got a question for Tom, please post it. Um, and I'll get it over to him. But we have David Parks came on to say hi, your excellence book. My story. Parks. David Parks. Oh, great. Fabulous. Clap, clap, clap. So David's <clears throat> on. He wanted to say hi and that the story resonated that he moved to Silicon Valley to, to do some work with you. But I've got a question from Selena here. She says, curious to know what Tom's perception of leaders of color at the helm, given their ability to empathize with the most vulnerable. Well, let me say this about people of color, and I'm basically specifically referring to Blacks, African Americans, I'm not sure which term is the appropriate uh, term now. I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland in the 50s, and it was the Deep South. I'm sad to say that we could stay even with Mississippi on kind of the segregationist uh, stuff. And then, a few years later, not a hero in any way, but I was involved pretty heavily in the civil rights movement and actually taught the first affirmative action course at Stanford while I was also a, a business school student. And relative to our questioner, I thought we'd, with the Civil Rights Act, I thought we'd kind of taken care of stuff. And I have been so embarrassed, so embarrassed ever since the George Floyd thing in the last six or eight months at how little I knew and how completely inequitable things are. We have made progress since, you know, Dr. King's time. There's no question about that. But I've been appalled at myself and I've been appalled. I'm a reader, 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 reader. I mean, there's no excuse for not knowing, but I just, you know, so first of all, to our questioner, 
my sincere personal apologies, you know, literally for being some famous guru with a four frigging degrees from Cornell and Stanford and not knowing his head from his butt relative to these issues. Uh, the interesting thing is I've been working on some, trying to make some one paragraph descriptions of the book that I've got coming out in a few months. And even when I reduce whatever it is, 400 pages to two paragraphs, I am focusing as hard as I can on issues of racial, not diversity, but it's, it's, I feel the same way that I did when I was said, you can't have less than 50% men. I think a board ought to look like the population. Uh, and African Americans, I think, are 16, 17, 18% of the population. Uh, I was a California boy forever, and there basically aren't going to be any non Hispanics in California in 20 years. Um, and, you know, her specific. I want it to be on everybody's agenda, and I want it to be out loud. And it is hard to talk about for a lot of people. Uh, and I hope it's, it's like my comment in general about people who give a hoot or don't give a hoot. I'm hoping maybe maybe that we're going to get somewhere. Uh, but and this is this is a downer and you and I would like to do uppers. Uh, but. The pretty. Agreed upon conclusions, which are getting worse with every passing hour, is last week's attack was a white supremacy attack. You know, there are a lot of other variables, but it's hard to dodge that. And that just makes me beyond the threat to democracy uh, so unbelievably deeply depressed. And I don't think that answered the question, but. Well, you know, I, I can only say this. I think your approach and the transparency and, in, in, you know, you've been in and around this conversation for a long time. And I think just saying that, you know, how you feel about your role is a lot more than a lot of people are doing, a lot, a lot of people are doing. So once again, one of the many reasons why I love you is just that you just will, you know, be as transparent and wear your heart on the sleeve. So let me get to other questions. Uh, I've got one that from Harold Mann, who says, Tom, that dirty airplane seat tray quote from your book has shaped my company's brand efforts for over 30 years. <laughs> so now you have to tell the story. Uh, it, it has a wonderful sequel. Um, I was in search of excellence, focused de facto, if not de jure, on customer service. And I was loud and noisy and doing 100 speeches a month and stuff and kind of got to be known as the customer service king. And I said, basically, I flew on a, I was on a flight and there were coffee stains on the flip down tray. And the minute I saw coffee stains in the flip down tray, the first thing that happened was I became scared to death because I assumed that sloppiness also carried over to the mechanics and you know, it's a cultural thing. So that's my coffee stains. The funny thing is that the airline, which I had long forgotten, was Southwest Airlines. And I became a reasonably close friend of the great late Herb Kelleher. And it started out at some public event in Texas. And he came up to me and he said, my first first words that I heard out of Herb Kelleher's mouth were, you son of a bitch. And, <laughs> and then we both started laughing hysterically and it was all good. And, you know, one of my favorite things is I did a, a PBS TV show some years ago and Herb was featured in the show and, and, uh, and Herb's 
wonderful former president, Colleen Barrett, was part of this act as well. And uh, but that's it's well, you know, the the bait. Oh, boy, I wish I had a minute to go back and get the book. Uh, the epigraph, one sentence which captures your view for my 2010 book, The Little Big Things, was a quote from Henry Clay. I should have it memorized by now, but it fundamentally said it is the little touches that stick in the mind for the longest. And, you know, you're a Salesforce person and you're right at the front edge of technology and technology is changing fast. And we use the word disruption more than we use, you know, the word the practically. And I buy that entirely. But differentiation comes from the small stuff. It really, really does. And it really is coffee stains on the flip down tray. Um, I've and. What we want, ideally, is a company of six or 6,000 with, if 6,000, we want 6,000 innovators. And by innovators, I mean the little touches, the little differentiators. You know, there's a, I've used the same first slide in my presentations for five or six years now. And the late great hotelier, uh, Conrad Hilton was asked, please share with the audience our secrets of success. And his response in full was, don't forget to tuck the shower curtain into the bathtub. And the story is powerful for several reasons, or two that I will point out. Number one, I come to your hotel, Tiffany, because the location is perfect and you had a famous architect who created a beautiful structure. That's why I come. I come back because of the tucked in shower curtains. And I do my social media spiel because of the tucked in shower curtains. That's point one. Point two, if tucked in shower curtains are the biggest differentiator de facto, then the people who tuck the shower curtains in are the most important people in the organization. And the housekeeping department is at least as important as the product development department. And needless to say, the average member of a housekeeping department in the average hotel in America and maybe anywhere else is not exactly treated like the king or queen of the roost. There's However, now they are essential workers. They are. There's a, a wonderful book. Matthew Kelly wrote a book called The Dream Manager. And it was a parable, but it turned out it was folk, it was actually based on a on a housekeeping housekeeping company. And the fundamental hypothesis, he said, every employee has a dream. And in that housekeeping department, uh, the kind of average person is a single mom with two kids working two or three jobs. And and he says. If you can just find some little practical way to help her take a step forward, to help her get into a community college course that allows her to learn a little bit about accounting or what have you, that that changes her life. Uh, and, and I love the dream, the dream manager and everybody has a dream. And, you know, we always say, oh, you're talking about Elon Musk. No. I am talking about that single mom with two kids working three jobs. Her dream interests me a hell of a lot more than Elon Musk flying by himself to the moon while flapping his arms. <laughs> I get, I mean, it's, Elon is fine, but I, was, I think it was on Twitter and somebody said, uh, Elon Musk is one of the two greatest people in the world. And I responded and I said, listen, I admire his audacity, his aims. And Elon Musk, to me, I think is almost as important as a truly inspired second grade teacher who changes the lives significantly of 23 kids every year and has been doing so for the last 25 years. She ranks above Elon on my list. 
Well, because Elon was taught by some second grade teacher at That's some right. point. Absolutely, absolutely right. true. And I was raised by a teacher, so I, I, you know, a single uh, mom who was a teacher. Oh my so God. I get it. I get it. Most but amazing, I Tiffany. Uh, uh, we didn't have any money, and there was a local private school. It was, it was a million miles from a New England boarding school, uh, and my mother, who had been a a stay-at-home mom uh, started teaching and she started teaching fifth graders and she was a pistol. She was a force of nature. And so I remember her memorial service in Annapolis, Maryland. And I said my words and some other people said their words. And when the whole thing was over, I had kind of a line of about 25 or 30 people. And they were her former fifth graders a lot of them age 45 or so. And every one of them said, your mom changed my life during that year. And, you know, that beats Elon dead to rights in my, in my book. It is that your mom and that collection of, of uh, elementary school teachers who I just worship, God bless them. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, during this last sort of 10 or 12 months, as we've realized that education has been completely upended uh, and how we can make sure that we keep that going during this time while keeping our teachers and our kids safe. Right. It's uh, you know, we don't have enough time to go into the sort of future of what education should look like. But I think, you know, right now, as parents are teachers and you know homeschoolers and workers and, you know, spouses and everything, pet parents and all the things simultaneously. Uh, you know, I think that that teachers are are uh, way more than essential. That's for sure. Absolutely. It, it, I'm going to digress, but it's at least slightly related. Uh, my favorite thing in my new book, and I hadn't found, seen it, and so I didn't have it in my in my 2018 book is a study, the results of a study that Google made of its top employees and its most innovative teams. And this is Google where a minimum IQ of 217 is required to even be a curtain tucker. Uh, and the top employees had eight traits and seven of them were the soft stuff. They listened. They respected the other person, they engaged, and then they went to the most innovative teams. And if this is true, Google does something that all other people have done it, that disgusts me. Employees are A players or B players. Uh, a, it disgusts me, and B, it's stupid, because if you call me an e B player, you have just done the greatest act in human history to demotivate me. But forgetting that, the point of the this, re this was serious, you know, Google is quant world. This is serious research that they did. The B teams were far more innovative than the A teams. You know, you had the people with IQs of 317, and then you had the people who listened to each other and built on each other's ideas and respected diversity of background or gender or whatever it happened to be. And it's just such a beautiful story because it's, you know, I lived in Silicon Valley for 30 years and, you know, there's nothing, there's a, I mean, the, the equivalent of that in a funny way, uh, there's a guy by the name of Peter Miller and he is the uh, boss of a biotech company that's called Optin, Optinos. And I don't remember where I found the line, but his line was to keep our culture the way we want it to be. We only hire nice people. <laughs> and what he specifically said that was so cool to me is he said, look, I need somebody with some incredibly obscure microbiology PhD. He said, guess what? There are actually a lot of them around. You know, hire the nice ones, leave the jerks. And uh, one of the things that I'm emphasizing in my new work 10 times more than I have in the past is... Uh, Hire for EQ, and by EQ, I don't really mean Daniel Goldman's test. Hire for empathy. Uh, hire for the people skills in 100% of jobs. And promote for the people skills times 
hundred. You know, I have argued, and for our colleagues in sizable companies, the number one asset that a company has is its entire portfolio of first line managers. And there is research up the gazoo that says that they are responsible for every variable worth talking about, uh, from retention to innovation to you name it. Uh, if your first line, and the other side of it is the research is also clean that says the primary reason by a long shot that people leave jobs is not whether the company was cool or uncool, not whether it was honest or dishonest, but the quality of their first line supervisor. Well, we had a really great conversation about this on our last podcast. So I'll put it in the notes after this about sort of the power of middle managers. And you give a whole story about, you know, when in battle, who do you, you know, who, who do you want to be in your foxhole? Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was a, I was a, a combat engineer, Navy CB in Vietnam. And when we were heading out to a project and we had 10 Jeeps and chief petty officers are the equivalent who run the Navy. I always rode in the front Jeep and my chief rode in the back Jeep. And somebody said, what are you trying to show off? I said, no, that'd make a damn bit of difference if I get blown up by a mine, but it makes a hell of a lot of difference if my chief does who's in the back. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't a throwaway line. I was not looking forward to being blown up by a mine and God blessed me and I wasn't, but I really did mean what I, what I said. I get in trouble. I used to get in trouble occasionally. I love getting in trouble with military people that way. It's, it's one of the reasons you would appreciate. I said to somebody, the reason I've been able to be a little bit more effective than women sometimes are in talking about these women's issues is that I'm, I'm untouchable. I am an old white male combat veteran you can't find any soft shit in my portfolio <laughs> with an engineering degree no but it's, it's really true you know well i dismiss him he's a whatever i had a philosophy degree oh, for god's sakes he wouldn't you know but you can't you know don't f with me you know well I'm I'm, you know interested in my grade point average on my cv i'm interested in this other stuff and it really I mean, it's been so god only knows tiffany you could tell me 800 stories I've been in programs, you know, talking about these issues with women speakers and men speakers. And so frequently, the woman is a hundred times more knowledgeable than I am. But when she says the same thing I say, everybody crosses their, or the males cross their arms. And A, it makes me want to puke. And B, it makes me wish I had been, you know, born with Arnold Schwarzenegger's, Schwarzenegger's muscle because I would have run into the audience and, popped every one of them. Yeah, trust me. Uh, I wish I didn't uh, understand that statement, <laughs> considering yeah. I'm a woman who does a lot of keynotes. But, oh, you know, I, know. I, I would... Uh, uh, well. Yeah, so I, I know we got, we've got to wrap up because we've gone a little long, but, like, I could keep talking to you for hours and days, as you know. But I sent you a little something in the mail. Did you get it? My Your wonderful cartoon? Oh, Jesus, that was... People loved it at Twitter, and I love it. And now not only do I have a, my own copy, but I have my own copy, which is framed with a screw to screw it into the wall, which I will do. Uh, I'll tell you what it'll be next to, because it goes back to this. Uh, I can't see it. If I could, I'd grab it. Uh, it'll go next to a magazine cover. And no, the magazine cover was not of me. I am a Cornell engineer. And I get a magazine called the Cornell Engineering Quarterly. There were 800 engineering matriculants in my class, class of 65, but matriculating in 1960. Of the 800, one was a woman. And on the cover of the Cornell magazine in question, that woman was on the cover. And next to her, was a smiling young cherubic face of a youngster who had matriculated. And I think it's the class of 2022. Class of 2022 at Cornell, 51% women. 
Yes. Now your problem, Tiffany, which you need to fix, is most of them ain't in computer science. <laughs> you know, they're take, I mean, I mean, God, did if you had on if you had the woman who who what's her name? Oh my God, is it who wrote the book Brotopia? Emily Chang. Emily Chang. I thought it was that, but I didn't want to. Oh, I am a 25-year, 30-year citizen of Silicon Valley who started when I went to Stanford in 1970 and had my office in downtown Palo Alto until the year 2000. I was disgusted by the book. Yeah. So, you know, strange. It, Emily you and I went to that. You're a, <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a female, powerful techie. Get it fixed. Okay. I'm on it. I'm on it. So I Emily and I, I want you to fix the damn thing. Emily and I went to the same high school oh randomly. God, did you really? Oh, that's but fabulous. She's much younger than I am. That's for sure. But anyway, Tom, what I also did in that little gift I gave you was I wrote a hand note yes, because Tom is a huge fan of writing a hand note. So I said, if there's anybody who will appreciate it, it's Tom. So I hand wrote that and sent it off. But I just want you to know how much I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you to everybody for your questions and for joining us. Make sure you follow Tom because now, as you know, he'll just say it like it is, um, which is one of the things I just love about him. And also um, go check out his new book, Excellence Now. It's in an ebook now, uh, and we'll give all the information at the bottom of this as well. But I thank you, Tom. I send you a huge hug. I love you, my friend, and I can't wait to see you soon. Same, same, Tiffany. It's really, I... I've never had an hour or whatever length of time we're talking go so fast. It's so energetic to talk with you. I know I'm pretty energetic, but boy, you can go one on one and you know probably beat me at the margin. So this is the, I don't I hope I hope the people watching have enjoyed themselves. Or I have. That's all that matters, Tom. Take care. I'll see you soon, my friend. Okay. You too. Bye, everybody. Peace.